Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blayton. This is Patchin, the show from Sound Notion TV dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. Today we're going to be joined by composer, educator, and electronic music performer, Jason Bolte. But first, we've got some news items to take care of. The biggest one, Finale 2014 is out. Having not upgraded anything since 2012, this is a big one. And they have a lot of new features. Most notably, they have magnetic layouts for all of your crescendos, decrescendos, and other uh, smart objects. This is a real time saver. I've already done a couple of scores in it. I love it. You should get it if you're a Finale user. That's amazing. Really excited for that one. I, another thing that I've, I've been looking at myself, and I keep almost buying... It's a new, uh, new synthesizer from Arturia called the Micro Brute. It's a, it's a follow-up to the Mini Brute synth, and it's an all-completely analog monophonic synth, just under $300. There's a, a fun little kicker. There's no presets. It's like the, like the old ones from a long time ago. You, you, you move all the knobs, that's your sound. Uh, <laughs> you can control it via MIDI, but I don't, I don't know if that MIDI control goes over to um, controlling each of the things. So, like... Yeah, it's real, like, this is a, a thing that you got to just maneuver, and then you play the notes, and that's, that's it's going to sound wonderful. Well, I've been almost buying the Micro Brute for over a year now, so <laughs> this yeah, might exactly. finally tempt me. <laughs> um, next up on our news list, uh, Little Bits, the uh, analog hardware uh, manufacturing company. They make little snap-together modules that you can use to create electronics projects. They have teamed up with Korg to make a synthesizer design kit. All the modules integrate into the existing little bits modules. They just snap together with magnets that uh, conduct power, and you can now use these to design your own synthesizers. They're not out yet, but if you go to littlebits.cc, you can start uh, counting down the days. I believe that they start at $159 for the kit. Sounds quite interesting. I uh, yeah, I might have to check that out myself. Um, on the less like close, <laughs> getting a little further from the metal, uh, our lovely Windows and Apple operating systems both have upgrades to their operating system. OS X or OS ten point nine and Windows eight point one are both out. As a current user of, let's see, what do I have? Ten point six. I. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not so quick to upgrade myself, and I should probably check these out. But as, as with many upgrades, you've got to be careful. Make sure that your software is compatible with the new versions and everything. But I'm sure these are wonderful new features from Apple and Microsoft. I do, I do happen to know, Producer Dave here interjecting, uh, that there is a font rendering bug in Sibelius with Mavericks. It only affects the dialogues. It doesn't affect the font rendering in your score. But if, if it'll bug you, if the fonts are in weird places and the type text is in weird places in your dialogue boxes, hold off a bit. Yeah, I like what you did there, Dave. Just in case you're bugged by a little font thing. I see that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've been running Mavericks since it came out uh, with primarily Max MSP, Pro Tools, Ableton Live, and Reason, and I haven't encountered any issues with it yet. Uh, that's good to know. So that's yeah. good to know. And both Sounds upgrades good. are free, unlike past upgrades from both Microsoft and Apple. Sounds like a wonderful thing. So let's move on to our guest this week, Jason Bolte. Is that how you pronounce your last name? That is how you pronounce it. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, no problem. Glad to be here. I didn't want to say that I'm also on 10.6, so don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> there seems to be a contingent of diehard Snow Leopard users who just want to <laughs> give it up. <laughs> hey, everyone looks fine. So <laughs> Old strong, yeah. Right, it's just until uh, Pro Tools 12 or whatever comes out and it yes. says, you know, OS X 10.9 only and Windows whatever, XP probably knowing did you design. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so just a quick uh, rundown. Uh, Jason Bolte, UMKC grad. Mm -hmm. uh, he is currently teaching at uh, Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. So you probably have more snow than we do in Michigan already. Um, my condolences. Honestly, to this year, not. It is there really? are, There's snow on the mountains, but there is nothing outside my window. Oh. So. Sounds oh, it's a I slow year. Get... Man. <laughs> it is a slow year this then. year. So hopefully we'll get some more. Yeah, I had to. Uh, we had snow yesterday in Michigan. It was my first time uh, this year running 
uh, this morning in snow. I had to put the cleats on to my shoes. Not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, getting back to Jason, uh, Jason has been doing a lot of pieces. Uh, you've won ASCAP Seamus Awards and have had numerous performances all over the world. So let's talk about your music. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, to start with, uh, there's a piece of yours that I have been really digging since I heard it back at Seamus in April. Uh, it's called Child's Play, mm-hmm. uh, which you use as a title because you sampled your, da- your daughter's toys in order to create a lot of the sounds that are in this piece. Which is really cool, and you have some of the cleanest samples that I've ever heard, but to me what's even cooler is the fact that you're integrating aspects of uh, non-academic music into this as well, that yeah, it's, there's yeah, a group. Yeah. yeah, there is. <laughs> there definitely is. Uh, yeah, it's the, the whole series, I actually have three pieces uh, dealing with my daughter's Boys, at least my oldest daughter. Now, now I have to write three more for my youngest daughter, who's uh, um, <laughs> let's see, fifteen months now. Well, so you can't I play feel, favorites. I feel pressure on that. Uh, <laughs> but but the first series, it, it's actually a series of three pieces. Uh, Child's Play is the uh, last one, actually, in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they actually get more um, abstract over time. Uh, the first piece in the series is very uh, um, very based on on uh, direct samples and, and uh, working through those. Uh, Child's Play is, is kind of a, I was looking, for all these pieces, I was looking to explore some different avenues uh, mm-hmm. that, that were interesting to me. And, and to be honest, I was finished. This is, this is, I was actually part of my, my final piece in my dissertation uh, on there. And, uh, you know, being away from uh, the, uh, uh, the academic world for a while and, and teaching it. I think there, were, there were a lot of influences uh, for my students in that, in dealing with rhythm and dealing with groove and that type of thing. And it was definitely a conscious choice uh, in that piece uh, to, to look at some of those things and, and, uh, and drive forward um, mm-hmm. on there. And I know there's, like, there's a, a whole vocabulary of uh, people using technology to give, like, I mean... There's, I know there's a, a certain affinity with computer music and this kind of electronic pop and stuff. And, mm-hmm. and I, there's the, the whole world of acu- electroacoustic music where people <laughs> kind of veer in a different direction. But sure. I, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't... I, uh, I know there's all this stigma of using, using groove <laughs> in, in an academic setting and everything. Mm-hmm. I don't, um, but I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, what, what was your process going through, like, Choosing samples of different toys and, and choosing, like, wh- like where you draw the line with different kind of rhythmic elements and things. Sure, you know it was. Um, I, I had been using those samples for. Let's see, the first. It was a drawn out process. I had I had been messing around with those samples since like two thousand and nine, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, Child's Play, I think, was finished in 2011 or 2010. So there was, a, there was like three years there that I, that I was uh, uh, playing around with those samples. So, you know, I was, for that, for the final piece, the Child's Play piece, I was really looking for rhythmic activity that was, that was interesting. Um, and just exploring that with, uh, with uh, some um, very simple sort of manipulation. Uh, most of the... Uh, Manipulation was done in uh, medicine, actually. Really, uh, the rhythmic manipulation. Yeah, um, the uh, oh, I forget what it's called. I can look it up on my computer. But the uh, um, oh, I can forget what the process is called. Goodness. Well, there's a process in there that lets you do rhythmic. Uh, uh, it separates things into grains, uh, really long grains. Uh, okay. For example. Okay, and and then reorganize the rhythmic rhythmic temp, uh, rhythmic structures in, in in varying tempos and things. So, so this was this was yeah. So it wasn't necessarily. I mean, it definitely was a conscious effort to to focus on the rhythmic activities and to focus on bringing in sort of some things that my students had been bringing in to, to comp lessons and and class because uh, that you know I th- there's no reason for those to be separated. I mean, it's it's um, I think we need to. Uh, I, I, myself as a composer, I like to draw from a variety of different areas, uh, whether yeah. it be whether it be uh, 
you know, the, I guess, you know, you always tell your students, at least I tell my students that, yes, you will study 12-tone technique because, boys, sometimes it's what you need to use. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, in minimalism and all that stuff, in popular music, I mean, there's just in, so many different avenues that you know, I, I don't want to segregate myself um, from not using those type of things. Uh, yes, I'm a classical composer. Boy, that's definitely true in my music, and it's definitely acousmatic. Uh, but I am interested in all those other types of things that are going in the popular world as well as and, and I actually find for myself and especially in this piece that my students what they bring in and has really influenced how I go about composition and how I uh, use those rhythmic elements in the, in a piece mm-hmm. and in, in, in this uh, work it 's been working up to this uh, this last piece and actually I have a uh, a new piece that 's uh, about well it 's about a year now a oh, year old uh, called putting around which is uh, uh, available on my SoundCloud, or it's also available on my website, which I think there it is up there uh, on the site. And it, it also is is sort of based on uh, a regular rhythm with a groove. Uh, type of thing. So, cool. yeah. Now, um, you're touching on something that I always find really interesting, which is the fact that in academia, there's really sort of this bias against anything that's popular. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that throughout my entire career uh, going through the university system. Um, is that something that now that you're on the other side of academia that you're consciously uh, ignoring <laughs> or blurring <laughs> lines on <laughs> in order to uh, to really kind of connect better with your students? Or is it something that um, you don't really think about and you really just want them to learn the fundamentals of music technology and sequencing and sampling and then just kind of let them do what they want? Well, you know, I think it's... I, I, you know, as an educator, I think I'm very conscious of that, and I think everybody needs to be conscious of what their students are doing outside of class. Oh um, yeah, I mean it's it's uh, <laughs> it's it's such an important aspect because I mean this. I mean to be, to be honest, it's 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 what makes you know it. What they're going to do outside is 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 what they're what they're. Well, I want to put it that way. How do I want to put this? Um, you know what they're doing in class is is yes, we at, at Montana State we do. It's uh, it's very. I wouldn't say as stringent classical, you know, acousmatic synthesis type of process uh, that, that are, as maybe at other institutions. And I, and I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think that, that, uh, that crossover is really important. And being on the, on the other side of the doctorate, I think, is, um, hasn't necessarily – well, it's affected me in, in, in definitely some ways that I probably wouldn't approach this material uh, while I was uh, – uh, working on my doctorate just simply because I, there were so much other things that I, that I needed to work on, I guess, as a composer, uh, that, that I didn't really feel, and I also didn't really feel confident. This is, this is, uh, I like to work outside of my comfort zone and this, you know, dealing with, first of all, dealing with, with pitch for a very long time was out of my comfort zone, like, like traditional pitch, traditional pitch structures and, you know, okay. even triads out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, and then also dealing with rhythm, regular rhythms was completely, or, and metrical rhythms and grooves was completely outside of that. So I, I, I tend to, to to gravitate towards ideas and pieces or structures and pieces that I'm not comfortable with um, at the time I'm writing. And I don't know if I'm even comfortable with those type of things now, but at least I feel like I can accomplish something. So so I think, you know, I, it's not that... Um, Sort of the rhythmic aspect is something that I've I've picked up later. Um, it's something I've been interested in, and in, you know, teaching and, and working with students has, has definitely influence on that and and uh, bringing that into the into my compositional world for sure. Um, and I don't think there should be a separation. I mean, there's some really really cool things that I think are probably going that are going on, and my students bring in um, that are going on in the popular world and sort of the experimental uh, uh, DJ and those type of things that I just think are great and. Uh, yeah. um, I wish I had more time to listen and become more more of a, a, an aficionado or a, or a uh, uh, you know an expert in that. But boy, I am not. Yeah, that, <laughs> well, I know I mean, I'm. I'm really reminded of uh, the Dead Mouse article that he posted that says all you're doing is hitting the space bar at yeah. your concerts, and yeah, that's what's called. Been, we all press play if you're. We all Googling. press play. That's it. <laughs> And I mean that's so true of so much of the academic music, but it's also true of the big EDM festivals oh, sure. and dubstep. And yet there's still this huge bias between the two. That one is academic and serious, and the other is uh, just this lowbrow pop. 
Right. Well, I mean, there's, 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 I mean, they're written for two different, two different, two different purposes. I mean, it's, it's, it's like saying, well, you know, the dance music, I mean, it's written for a purpose. There's a reason why there's a beat. It's a reason why there's, there's something that's metrical. There's a reason why there's something, uh, uh, regular because people are dancing to it. Um, right. you know, and I, and I think if we look, if you look outside, I mean, if, if the rhythm is what bothers you, um, and, and for some people, I think there is that that connotation. If you look outside of that, there's some really interesting synthesis and some really and some really, uh, you know, interesting other things that are going on. I mean, the same thing could say for, for acoustic music. You can't. I mean, uh, acousmatic. It's really hard to dance to. <laughs> um, you know, you, you go to you go to conferences and and, and I mean, there's it's. Uh, I mean, for the average person, it's really hard to dance to. Let's let's not. I mean, there's some beautiful <laughs> pieces out there with trained dancers right. that is just gorgeous, and I, I you know I love that type of thing. But for the average person, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's you know r- metrical rhythm and regular rhythm. In some ways, I think it's ingrained in our culture and it's ingrained in the way our body works and, and just a variety of other things. So, so you know, I I really I really like. I'm beginning to to. Um, appreciate it more and influencing my, my output and how, how it works in, in, in my work. Um, so I don't know. I, yeah. I think you've achieved some really interesting results as well. And oh, thank you. it's a, yeah, it's a, I mean, we, we've been spending a lot of time on kind of <laughs> the, the delicate things of, of traversing this, uh, this dicey territory, but I think you're doing sure. it's, it's a, yeah. Like Ben and I, well, mo- most of us in our little crew, we all operate between the popular and classical worlds in mm-hmm. different ways, and and I think that there's some really really powerful things to happen in in that land in between. I think so too. Yeah. 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 Um. I, you mentioned this other piece, and I and you keep mentioning your students, which is really intriguing to me. But mm-hmm. You mentioned this other piece uh, that's a little more recent, putting around, yep. where and. Uh, looking at the description, I hadn't made this connection that you you talk about using, uh, or it, that the electronic music studio's voltage controlled studio temp three is a big yes. part of of this piece. And I'm, I'd be yeah. interested to hear you talk about that. Well, it was a uh, um, the piece is putting around, and it was a rich, it was a commission uh, by a um, irritable hedgehog uh, uh, label. That deals. It's probably mostly well known for their uh, minimalist um, CDs that they've been putting out. Really, some really great stuff. Uh, and if you just search for Irritable Hedgehog, uh, it'll come up. And just some some uh, really great stuff. Uh, but uh, David McIntyre, who uh, I went to school with at, at UMKC, uh, is on is one of the one of the founders of that label. And he also does some electronic music with that label. And he put out uh, just a just a sort of a. a Call, I guess, to a bunch of bunch of his uh, close friends and acquaintances uh, to write um, a series of pieces dealing with samples he did in 1980 uh, on this oh. uh, voltage-controlled synthesizer. Yeah, uh, yeah, and 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 if you if you if you don't know David McIntyre, he is a composer that's very, like I said, very interested in minimalist music. So it was it was uh, lots of long sine waves and bleeps and bloops and all the stuff that you would have done on an analog synthesizer. Well, that you could have done very easily on an analog synthesizer in the eighties. Um, yeah. and, uh, I, I, I took those and I, and I told, to be honest, I told David, I said, I just can't work with this. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very, very, very understanding. Uh, and actually I took the material and I just cut it up and, and processed the heck out of it and, cool. and, and went from there. So, so the basis of the sounds are still David's, 1980s um, um, synthesizer samples of all these sort of you know resonating filters and all this stuff. These little examples, uh, but it, it's been just processed completely. And 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 uh, uh, if you listen to it, probably has no recognizable. Well, I take that back. There is one part where I put uh, one of David's original sort of excerpts or etudes inside of the piece. Uh, it's kind of hard to hear, but it is there. <laughs> But yeah. but yeah, all the sound files are all the, all the audio is derived from there. It's just like 50, you know, ten generations later and things like that. And that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting project to use mm-hmm. uh, this older audio. And it's interesting that we can have like really old audio at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, but to use this older audio and uh, and use modern tools and techniques to really mm-hmm. change it and do do something to make it your own. Um. The uh. The uh, my other question related to this. Um. Mm-hmm. 
I, uh, I noticed that you, you, so you teach a lot. You, you, you seem to get a lot of inspiration from your interaction with your students mm-hmm. and, and through teaching and things. Um, but it seems like you, you also teach uh, different things with electronic music and recording and music tech and composition and all, all over the board. Right. And uh, what, uh, Ben and I have each taught <laughs> com- computer music classes and and I've talked with other people about different strategies in, in terms of using different kinds of hardware or different kinds of software or uh, in, incorporating composition in different ways. And uh, bringing up this older synthesizer, the Putney, was, it was an interesting thing. I, w- I was wondering, um, like, do you ever approach this kind of older hardware in, in any of your, your teaching or anything with your students? Or? Uh, in our, in our, in our uh, curriculum, we do. Um, we have uh, at, at Montana State. We've got uh, actually. Um, I'm on faculty here with uh, uh, Linda Antos. Okay. I don't know if you're remember, uh, familiar with uh, Linda's work. Uh, Linda is one of my colleagues, so we so we sort of share this. We also have a uh, a, a, a PhD student uh, who uh, um, Patrick Patrick Donnelly, uh, who is a computer science major, and he also went to uh, Peabody uh, Conservatory and studied uh, electronic music there. Uh, who also teaches some of our synthesis courses, uh, and yeah, we do use uh, um, we do have we we have we do use a, a Moog. We have a Mini Moog Voyager. Uh, ah, and I think, and I think it's really important that uh, that students get that experience. Uh, we also uh, teach uh, um, analog synthesis on a on one of the uh, uh, ARP virtual synthesizers on the computer yeah. cable oh, nice. type of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think understanding the basics of that and, and understanding voltage control. Uh, and, and basic synthesis paradigms, well, not basic, but um, non-computer oriented, let's put it that way, um, yeah. synthesis yeah. paradigms are extremely important just because it underlines everything, especially with the resurgence of, um, as you were talking earlier, the, uh, the micro brute and the mini brute and uh, exactly. the, uh, the new release of the MS, what is it, the, the Korg MS-20, the mini? Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, all these things are coming back and they're affordable. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is and actually I'm I'm looking to buy I was looking at notes here I'm looking to buy actually three of the a couple of the micro brutes or the mini brutes for the studio um, here uh, which I think are great uh, great little devices and, and by the way they don't um, just because I've done a little research on this uh, they um, I believe they're the the only MIDI messages they send and receive are note on and note offs yeah okay that's so what there's I thought. control over yeah, yeah. synthesis paradigms. Which makes sense for you know listing at two hundred ninety nine dollars. So. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I th- I think those those basic concepts are, are extremely extremely important. Um, and then moving from there, uh, you know, our degree is at Montana State, and what what Linda and I teach is is really really broad based. Um, so it's in the in the traditional sort of music technology degree that developed in the late eighties and nineties. Ours is sort of smack dab right in the middle. Cool. Uh, of those types of degrees, so so there there we we teach everything, and I teach everything from you know recording technology um, to uh, acoustic composition, electronic composition, orchestration for new media. Uh, we do film uh, audio for film and video. So it's just a real variety of of topics that we cover, um, which of course can be a strain because you you wind up being a you know a, uh, what's the term a jack of all trades, and at least for me, uh, our students I think are really well prepared um, for. Uh, for a variety of different careers. You just never know what you're going to do. I mean, we're not producing, not every one of our students is going to be a composer. Not every one of our students is going to be a uh, recording engineer. There's just so many options out there. Yeah. In technology right yeah. Now. I mean, it sounds like a good strategy, giving them the yeah. li- liberal arts degree of music technology that gives you a little bit of everything so they can go off in, their own, in whatever direction that suits them. Yep. Yeah. Now, um, you've been talking a lot about how your students have influenced you. Um, can you get into a little bit about your compositional process? Sure. Um, I, I, I work a lot with, um, with basic sample, samples. Uh, I don't do a lot of synthesis, per se, from, from, from you know, a, a traditional standpoint. Um, you know, if I was going to do FM or AM or you know, any type of, of uh, wave packet or something. I, I don't do a lot of that type of thing. Um, uh, usually, I, I like I like to work to. I'm a very physical person, I guess, and I like to work with physical sounds. Uh, if it, I guess if it was up to me, I'd still be cutting tape. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which, which I which I, I, I you know I was uh, 
uh, you know, I don't know how, how old you guys are, but I'm thinking we're about the same age, um, yeah. uh, Nate, Nate and, and I know Ben's about my age. You know, we, we, we came in right as undergraduate, right as digital was, was coming in and analog was sort of trickling out. So, so I did a few pieces with tape, you know, cutting and splicing and doing that. And it was just, awesome. it, was, it was very visceral and it was very hands-on. And I really liked that aspect of it. So I tend to, tend to use... Um, do sort of concrete, you know, um, process concrete, I guess you would call it, um, acousmatic type of things. So I, I generally always start with, with, with recorded sounds. Um, they're just, maybe it's just because they're easier, um, because they already have context. They already have a frequency spectrum that's very complicated. They already have inherent rhythmic activities. They already have you know, overarching sort of flow of what happens to the sound and how it ends. There's a phrase already constructed there for you. Right. Um, and, and maybe it's just my way out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but but, it, but it, has, it has a lot of things. For me, real world sounds have, have a lot of things going for it. Mm. And, and sampled sounds have a lot of things going for it. Because it, it already has all those musical connotations built in. Um, as a composer, I think part of, part of my job and part of what I enjoy doing is finding finding inside the sounds or in the sounds what is actually the musical shape what is how, how is the sound driving towards somewhere um and and in, and in some ways you know that's what's interesting to me is seeing how how these sounds work over time uh right. how an individual sample can lead into another one so you know you can go to the Dennis Smalley um uh sort of analysis of a gesture and texture and all those type of things uh, and, and to be honest, that's really what interests me is, is how, these, how these sounds progress over time. How can you make a musical stance without having, quote unquote, traditional sort of uh, musical melody and musical harmony or even, you know, um, I want to say other it, traditional. I mean, yeah, other traditional type of ideas. Yeah, um, these musical or devices. non-traditional yeah. ideas. I mean, we're dealing with sound that that is just you'll you know it's it's it, it's uh, can be heard anywhere. And how do, how do you how do you control? In some ways, how do you force it to become music musical and musical structures? Now, um, how does that work for you when you're adapting the sampled sounds to work with a live instrument for a instrument and tape piece or uh-huh. an axe or it's it's when I'm running an instrument tape piece, it's a struggle. Um, to be honest, uh, I uh, I have a hard time integrating those two, uh, and it it usually a, a tape and instrument piece usually takes me quite a bit longer than um, uh, just a straight you know straight up instrumental. Well, especially uh, a straight up sort of uh, fixed media piece. Um, yeah, right. the tape piece. I mean, the, uh, a fixed media and instrumental piece. It's always. What, for me, it's always what comes first. What do I play off of? How does this integrate? Um, I've tried various different options. Um, I've written a complete tape part and sort of went back and wrote the uh, um, instrumental part. Mm-hmm. That produces one type of outcome. Um, <laughs> I think it can be a very good outcome. Um, uh, uh, the, one of the pieces that I did that with, I, I think, is... is uh, uh, I really, I really like, uh, and I think it's a successful piece, uh, um, a piece for piano, scrap metal. Um, oh, yeah. Which, it uses inside the piano stuff, which, of course, leads, lends itself to doing it that way. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, it's almost like, yeah, that was a fun piece. Uh, it's almost <laughs> like uh, composing, uh, composing a fixed media or, or, or for, for just a live instrument, which is great. Um, yeah. I've done it the same time, which I think, to be honest, is probably... Um, probably my best, the best way I found to do it um, is to work sort of where, you know, sometimes the piano, the electronic parts gets ahead a little bit. Sometimes the, uh, um, the uh, instrumental part gets a little ahead of it. Uh, when, when I, when I, when sometimes when I get ahead, if I don't, if I let myself go and I start writing too much of one, in, one, one part of the piece, it's like, it's like writing, right. If you're writing an orchestral piece and you just write violins for, Ten measures, you know, for twenty measures, and come back. Oh, now I've got to write everything else. Yeah, yeah, right. right. <laughs> so, so I struggle with that. It's, it's more of if I progress with with ideas together, I think I, I think it uh, uh, works out a little bit better than uh, uh, some of the other pieces that I've written, where something you know, the tape or the or the or the instrument just sort of take over. Um, 
Yeah. It's, you know, when I, when I approach that instrumental and uh, electronic surrounding, I always look at it as um, um, not as a, um, um, like a soloist versus a ensemble um, uh, type of thing. I, I try, to, try to envision it as a complete whole. Mm-hmm. Um, where the where the electronics and the instrument have equal weight um, in the piece, and they work together uh, to perform to to combine to a whole, uh, rather than a um, a clarinet solo with a tape accompaniment. Um, that's that's not necess- That's not really how I, how I work. I look at it as a whole sort of concept, where, where uh, uh, the instrument plays a, a, a substantial role and the electronics play a substantial role in the piece, and they their cohorts in creating uh, the way the piece out unfolds. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, it, it sounds like a really great strategy of approaching them <laughs> together. I've, uh-huh. yeah, I've, I've gone both ways with uh, doing instrument and tape pieces. And uh-huh. yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky. And I've, uh, yes. the thing that I've found to be really uh, tough for me it, it, an interesting kind of element to work around or work with is just the, that the instrument and the audio that you provide might op- end up in performance operating in really different acoustic worlds. Yes. And yeah. that's, it's a, it's a tricky. <laughs> yeah. I, I've had way too many experiences with that happening, whether it's uh, the room size uh, suddenly adds so much to whatever little minuscule amount of reverb I was using that it's a different piece or, you know, if uh, for whatever reason it just becomes unplayable uh, based on diffusion or some error in my Max patch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that generally is what happens to me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Programming problem. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> yep. Test everything, test frequently, and save as many backups as possible. That's yeah, my my other rule. I got yelled at at a it was a NASA conference for coding on the day of the performance. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I'm sure. Right, exactly. oh, no, I wouldn't be. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen some really cool live coded pieces, but oh. I I just don't have that level of confidence in my ability as a programmer to do that. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Especially in Chuck or Super Collider. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah I've Remember thou the semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got uh, the Super Collider book actually sitting uh, right next to my monitor right now. And uh, yeah, that could be the motto of that book. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's one thing I've never, I've, uh, the Super Collider is one thing I've just not gotten into. Um, yeah, me neither. You can only do so much, right? I mean,. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, I mean, it is so much better for algorithmic stuff than anything I've ever used oh, or done in Max MSP. Sure, just because it can spawn its own objects within the code. But, right. Yeah. Actually, and Jason, I, I was wondering, uh, do you have any favorite software or hardware that you works with, uh, or that you have worked with in, in your compositions? Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess um. <laughs> <laughs> everyone does. Come everyone on, everyone does. So, so no one can laugh at this, but uh, I am I, I'm still a diehard uh, digital performer fan. Okay, uh, cool. Okay, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I I'm it works well for me. Um, works great in Snow Leopard. Does yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no problems there. No, no, <laughs> no. It, it's a great piece of software. I'm I'm. Uh, um, yeah, I've done the Pro Tools thing uh, for for just just mixing and it, it, it you know love it for for editing and wouldn't if I, editing recordings and and doing uh, studio type of uh, recording studio type of work. It just doesn't work. Flow is just not exactly what I'm what I like um, in uh, uh, dealing with sound files. And then Logic, mm-hmm. you know the MIDI the MIDI is outstanding, and the instruments that come with are just just phenomenal. And it's a great. Great teaching tool, and uh, uh, it, the workflow just doesn't work for me um, in, yeah. in my composition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't use a lot of MIDI. I use a lot of sound files, so it just it. I don't like, and maybe I just haven't looked at that. I haven't written a piece in it in a while. Um, and I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, um, it, 
the last time I looked at it for myself as a composing tool, it just wasn't, it just didn't work. Um, you know, I've had the same experience with Logic, where I, I've got, I, I, my main computer is a work computer, and it came with Logic, that's what they use where I work now, and it's, yeah, like, the tools seem so amazing, but I just haven't gotten to, like, feel good and bring something in it yet. It's weird. Yeah. Well, the synthesis engines are great. I mean, and, and they're great yeah. teaching tools because they have a, just a variety of, I mean, you've got your sampler, you've got your variety of FM, you've got, you've got your modeling synthesizer. I mean, they're just, they're just really, and they're really great teaching tools. It's, it just doesn't work for me as a composing yeah. <laughs> tool. <laughs> you know, that's I mean, a common criticism I've heard from a lot of people. Uh -huh. um, I know Logic, from my own experience, is great for running a concert from. Mm? Uh, especially if you have multi-channel diffusion, but oh, sure. Oh, sure. I just the way that I work uh, and the way that I code in Max, it makes it so much easier just to do everything in Ableton. Oh, really? Do everything in Max and then uh, slam it all in Pro Tools. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've, I, I've never composed with Ableton. I've, I've I taught a class last semester with it, which I really enjoyed, uh, but yeah. uh, haven't just had haven't had a time to do that. You know, follow actions are probably my new favorite. Uh, feature of any uh, synthesis program or DAW or anything, period. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool, yeah. It's funny. The last time I had a really good relationship with a, with a DAW was actually like Cakewalk Pro Audio 9. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> next, next to me saying Vision Pro. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, um, for a doll, that, that's that's kind of kind of where I'm at. You know, when it comes to actual processing and those type of things, yeah. You know, it runs the gamut. I, I love MetaSynth. Um, yeah. Not only just for its rhythmic capabilities, which are which are really cool. Um, I could call. I can't remember what that what it's called, but it's like granul granulized thing. Um, yeah. But also, just the filters on it are just they're, they're just outstanding. Um, just the visual, being able to draw your, your you know, you, you know, your band pass or your, or your notch filter or whatever in there is for me is just so it's really physical because I'm, I'm really interested in, in that physicality. And that's really what spurs me on. Yeah. I'm looking at some screenshots of it. I haven't used it before. But I'm going to have to check this out. It seems really cool. It's kind of expensive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, that's it's, why I don't have a copy of it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's 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 you know the, the the thing that I love about it is that we can just you know you can you can bring up a, um, a, the filter um, bank for example and you can just draw your filters on the screen um, yeah. and it's just it, it's so liberating than having to automate it and do all this stuff it's it's yeah. just it's just really cool I, I just really I really like it and then of course um, you know sound hack. Of course, still around, still still running strong. Yeah. Uh, cool. There are probably probably my two favorites, but I but I, I generally experiment with a gamut of things. Um, I've uh, done work with F Scape, a lot of freeware, um, F Scape, yeah. Spear, uh, a couple of granular cool. synthesizers. Um, yeah, so there's a lot. Of, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of cool. And then of course the uh, uh, Michael Norris uh, Spectral plugins, which I think are just fantastic. Cool. Yes. Which are which are amazing. So, so I, I uh, you know, with actual tools with synthesis and things, you know, most of it's freeware uh, that mm -hmm. I use, except for MetaSynth, which at this point, I'm 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 so smitten by, I guess <laughs> 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 that that I, I just it's just a wonderful piece of software. It's great nice. to have a good relationship with a piece of software. It is it's important. <laughs> I think. Well, well, I was wondering, I yeah. so. It seems like you've got a bunch of other projects and things. So I was wondering if you've got anything interesting, uh, any things you're working on or any events coming up that you'd like to plug. You Other know? than trying to get free updates for life from MetaSynth. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, you know, that's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm actually, um, to be honest, this is my retention year here at Montana State. So I've been uh, doing a lot with uh, preparing that portfolio and dossier that's about. You know, about oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, so actually, my um, uh, what I've been doing has been a little bit limited, um, to be honest. Um, right now, I'm, I'm starting to work. I'm working on a piece, uh, another of my daughter pieces. Uh, this one from oh, the cool. youngest, the 18 month old, uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, some, not necessarily playing with her toys, but um, 
for this one, uh, it's dealing. You, you know these uh, uh, vents that you have in your and if you have a forced air um, uh, HVAC, yeah, you got these little oh, vents. Yeah. She loves to play on those, so I'm like, and, and makes sort of musical tone. I mean, tones, and she just swipes them around and things. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, so I'm working, starting to work on a piece of that uh, with that. Um, I have a couple other things in the pipe. Um, I, I'd like to like to work on a cello piece here soon. Um, you know, the, the the coolest thing I think I've done uh, in the past eight months or so is uh, did an installation. Um, uh, about uh, well, ba- basically about gravitational waves, um, huh. which are um, we have a at MSU. It's the um, it's it's we're, we're a tier one Carnegie Research Institution, and it's the big science school, the big ag school, uh, and we have some really you know cr- just phenomenal uh, uh, faculty in the sciences uh, here, along, along with the arts. I don't know the arts, but but you know just do, the <laughs> sciences. They're doing some some you know just groundbreaking work uh we have a a gravitational wave group um that does uh uh theoretical physics involving um basically uh einstein's theory of relativity but um um involving uh, black holes that are um being um well basically being able to detect black holes black holes and being able to detect gravitational waves that happen when two black holes collide and do a sort of a sp- spiral uh, and oh, fall into each other. Whoa. It supposedly creates this huge ripple in space time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we've we've got a uh, 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 group here that that's what they're dealing with, trying to detect them and doing stuff. So so uh, we had a big um, uh, Einstein celebration uh, here on campus. Week long event. We had you know we went out to schools and talked about gravitational waves and all this this thing. Uh, we did a. Uh, uh, um, a couple multimedia events. One that was a, um, a film uh, by our film department. Great film department here, um, okay. and uh, we commissioned a piece, um, um, uh, orchestral piece for it. And I was involved in that with engineering, but also uh, we did a uh, installation uh, called Black Hole with an H in parentheses. I don't know, uh, but okay. uh, really cool. First time I've done an installation work, and it was uh, it was it was a real great experience. It was. Um, Myself, uh, uh, Chris O'Leary, uh, video artist from L.A., uh, a couple people from on campus, an architect uh, designing the space, uh, cool. um, uh, one of our uh, Sarah Master, one of our uh, art, art uh, studio art people uh, involved. Um, so it was about five or six of us and a couple scientists. And it was, you know, it was, it was cool because it was scientifically based, but yet it was, you know, it was sort of an interpretation. It was, it was just great. It was very very cool with quad sound and projections of black holes on the floor. And that's um, brilliant. It nice. was cool. It was very cool. And you know, that that's something I've never done before. And I just, it, it was a really great experience and something I want, I really would like to continue uh, to look at. Um, but yeah, very cool. I guess. That's cool. Um, All right. Coming performances. I, you know, it's, it's, it's the time of year when almost it's uh, in the academic world, where uh, most everything is done and we're going on break and stuff starts up in the yeah. spring. Uh, I do, I, um, uh, really excited though, last, last month, and I think she's going to be, they're going to be doing it again. Uh, the Maverick Ensemble in Chicago um, uh, just performed, and I think they're going to do it on one more compass, uh, uh, concert. Uh, my uh, piano, p- uh, clarinet and electronics piece uh, with, your, uh, with my eyes shut. Okay. Uh, and they're going to be doing that. I don't know the exact date, but I think it's going to be coming up uh, again in Chicago here soon. So, cool. Nothing else major going on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not small things happening. <laughs> well, yeah, it could be big, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, Jason, thank you so much for uh, being with us. Hey, no and problem. I just lost audio for a second. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, there we go. <laughs> Why don't you hit that again? Did we lose Ben? No, we got Ben. Say that okay, again, right. Ben. I, I think I'm here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again, what you were just saying. Oh, uh, thanks for being here. And great to talk to you and to hear about all of your projects coming up in the future. Yeah, you're welcome. And thanks for having me. This has been great. Really, yeah. really enjoyed yeah. it. Well, you should tell your students. Oh, I will. We do this yeah, every right, month exactly. now. <laughs> well, so let's let's kick it into our recurring segment. Uh, we, we've been enjoying the end of these shows with a two-minute challenge. 
Ben's up this time. And Ben, what are you going to talk about? Well, Nate, I am going to talk about pure data. Do we have a timer on the clock? <laughs> a timer on the clock. Wow. Um, you ready? More <laughs> yes. Go. Released in 1996, Pure Data, or PD for short, is an open source graphical data flow programming language for creating interactive audio and video works, synth design or audio effects and processing, similar to Max MSP, which is appropriate because PD was developed by Max creator Miller S. Puckett, who continues to develop its main branch uh, with numerous other people who contribute external objects and to various forks of the main. As with other audio programming language, PD processes both uh, sample rate and audio rate, uh, control rate, sorry, uh, objects. Audio rate objects are always defined by having a nice little tilde next to them, uh, whereas control rate objects, like everything that you can see on the screen in my timer, do not have the tilde. Unlike other languages, it was designed to, at the start to use the host CPU and not to offload all of the audio processing onto a coprocessor or onto a DSP module. This contributes to the highly portable nature of the language, allowing it to run on Linux, OS X in uh, any number of native versions, or on iOS in the RJDJ program, and even in Android in Pure Data Party. <laughs> PD's library of around 180 core objects with hundreds of externals covers all of the bases you would expect in a modern language. Comments, math, logic, oscillators, filters, Fourier transforms, uh, and externals like Wiimotes or even the Xbox controller, which I was supposed to show you but don't have apparently. <laughs> um, with the GEM graphics library and granular synthesis elements, it also allows you to easily create just about anything you can conceive of as long as you know how to ask it to do it. In, a differences, in addition to differences with Max, such as its inclusion of data structures, uh, it has one major advantage. It's free. <laughs> <laughs> Came in just under the buzzer. <laughs> yep. Very nice. Well, thanks so much, Ben. Good work. It's a pure data. Really kind of... I So PD is my primary language, I would say. <laughs> and PD is what I learned on before I switched over to Max. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to get through in two minutes. I think you did a pretty good job. Nope. Well, and I, for those of you who want to download PD, I highly recommend checking out uh, puredata.info. Exactly. Yep. That's the site that has my personal favorite version, the extended version. It's very, very, very similar to the vanilla version, but it has all of those. You know, nice this sounds like a lot like you're breaking the, the two-minute <laughs> challenge rule right now. <laughs> I think it's good. So, yeah. yeah, check out PD. Check out all the other software that we've talked about. We'll have, we'll have notes on all of this in the show notes for this episode. And uh, so, welcome. Thanks again for tuning in on our Patch In Episode 1. And thanks so much, Jason Bolte, for joining us this week. Not a problem. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm Nate Blayton, Ben Furman and I are doing this show every month, and uh, yeah, please come back. We'll have, have another one next month. Thanks. <laughs>